She had been found not guilty at a separate trial and campaigned in vain to save her lover's life. Ollie is sentenced and is hanged four weeks later. Fast justice compared to today, four weeks, that was all it took. For almost a century, the Crippin case has been closed. Until poison's expert, John Trestrail, began to revisit the forensic evidence. I kept coming back saying, something's not right. Something's wrong in here we're not understanding. I have murdered and dismembered my wife and disposed of 99% of her body. Why do I leave 1% of it under the coal saw? The most important question in this case was, was this really Cora Crippen or not? John Tristrail realized that the question which sent Crippen to the gallows could be resolved using today's forensic science. The plan was to compare DNA extracted from the body parts with DNA from a relative of Cora Crippen. To establish the identity of the victim beyond reasonable doubt. Assembling all the evidence would mean collaborating with other experts. A genealogist's search, lasting five years, finally revealed that Cora Crippen was born Kunigunde Makamotsi, the daughter of Polish immigrants to New York. As an aspiring actress, she often used the stage name Belle Elmore. Working through these name changes and the generations eventually led to California and this family. Mrs. Marie Hamill, who is the grandniece of Cora Crippen, agreed to provide a DNA sample. The next priority was to find some of the original forensic evidence from 1910. Research led here. The Crippen case was such a landmark step in forensic pathology that some of the evidence has been retained for historical purposes. That's the key to the project. Something to match or not match against Cora's DNA. And, um, these particular... Ones these microscope slides contain marks. actual pieces of skin from the remains in the cellar. The jury was told that the skin bore a distinctive scar exactly like one which Cora Crippen was known to have. They're one of the crucial pieces of evidence which hanged Crippen, and exactly what the DNA experts were looking for. The tests would be done at Michigan State University, whose forensic biology unit uses advanced, sensitive techniques for analyzing ancient tissue. Team leader, Dr. David Foran, began a lengthy and expensive series of tests. A single microscope slide would be enough to work on. But after a hundred years, could he extract the DNA? The tissue had been processed quite a bit back then, which isn't helpful to us. On the other hand, it had been stored in a museum. And if we compare that to bones that have been buried in the ground for a hundred years, this was much better than, than that type of material. Dr. Foran had obtained DNA from Marie Hamill and two further grand nieces of Cora Crippen. What he was now looking for was any sign of a mismatch in the genetic code. And he found it. Not just once, but many times. Not just a single difference where we might say, well, that might have been a mutation that happened. We found a substantial number of differences which readily indicate that these are not maternally related. Even one difference indicated it wasn't Cora Crippen. In fact, there were five, but he had to cross-check with many other tests. I stepped back, waited a few weeks, and started over from scratch. Got new tissue, processed that again, compared that to the earlier DNA results, they were identical. He had to factor in another possibility. 
could the 1910 pathologist have left his own DNA on the slide? Even though it's a very thin slice of tissue, there's a lot of material there from whoever's body that was. And if someone had touched that sample to process it, the amount of DNA that they would have left behind would be minuscule. DNA from tissue on the slide would have swamped out any material that may have been left by a pathologist. I remember getting the call from David. He says, are you sitting down? I said, yes. He says, they don't match. It's not her. And I had this kind of real surreal feeling of, oh my God. Dr. David Foran's work on the Crippen case, revealed now in detail for the first time, made headlines around the world. In one small town in Michigan, this was much more than a news story. It was personal. The Crippens were one of the wealthiest, most respected families in Coldwater, Michigan. This was their home. And now, they want justice for their ancestor. I am the closest living male relative. When you see the evidence that has turned up now, uh, it was wrong to hang him. And that's why we're asking the British government for a pardon. The British government, in all honesty, owes it to us. But is he right? After all, someone's body parts were there in Crippen's coal cellar. What are these things doing there in the first place? How could they get there if it's not his wife? Then what are these things? If they're human, we don't even know the gender of these remains. They could be male or female. So if Dr. Crippen didn't murder his wife, who else might he have butchered? Forensic scientists at Michigan State University have produced sensational new DNA evidence in the case of Dr. Crippen. The murder victim was not his wife. Toxicologist John Tristrail has now seized on an intriguing theory. When times grew hard, and with both a mistress and a wife to support, Crippen looked at any way he could of making money. He carried out dental work. But perhaps his medical training was being put to another use, in secret. What if there were abortions being done? What if somehow Holly was involved in making money because his income is going down by doing abortions on the side? In an era when any surgery could prove fatal, a backstreet abortion could easily leave a body to be disposed of in secret. If Crippen was an abortionist, then one mystery began to make sense. The remains were said to contain a lethal dose of a little-known drug called hyacin. This is the only hyacin murder case I'm familiar with. Most people have never heard of this drug at all. But it was used in obstetrics, abortion, obstetrical procedure. Ah, that makes sense. So was the body the nameless victim of an illegal abortion? Dr. David Foran of Michigan State University carried out further tests to discover the gender of the remains using a new technique developed by his team over several years and 4,000 times more sensitive than the standard test. Now he's invited John Trestrail to hear the result. Confirmation that the body is female would at least fit the theory that Crippen had carried out a botched abortion and then tried to dispose of the body. It has some results. Um, this is a real-time assay. And those are the results from the slide DNA. So that would be positively female. This one? No, because you have two lines. This is your area, not mine. Um, <laughs> Female gives you one result. What do we got? This is an X and that's a Y. 
So what does that mean? It means it's male. Oh my God. <laughs> and we tested it multiple times. We're not looking at the pathologist DNA by any chance. Um, no, I'm confident of that. We tested it and tested it and tested it. Oh boy. So ideas? Yeah. I know you had some time to think about what males may be there. God, you know, it, it, it almost, I'm running scenarios through my mind of planted evidence now. It certainly takes out the question of the abortion problem. Yes, that does take out that one. So we've closed that door. Yes. Then how do we explain Hyacin? Oh, man. It throws all the evidence from the trial that ultimately hanged Molly Gruber. It throws it in the trash can. As far as that trial goes, I agree. Throws in the trash. Mm -hmm. Dr. Foran has promised to update Crippen's family on the test result. We managed to uh, determine the sex of the individual genetically, and uh, I thought I'd give you those results today. Tissue on that slide is male in origin. It's not a female sample at all. It's, it's definitely typed as male. You have just made my day. Michigan State University's work confirms that Crippen was executed for a crime he didn't commit. It was a miscarriage of justice. Which raises new questions. How did the remains get there? Was Crippen convicted in error? Or could he have been framed? John Tristrail is on his way to consult a legal expert who's made a special study of the Crippen case. Andrew Rose is an experienced defense barrister who says this investigation confirms his own long-held doubts. When you examine the DNA evidence, then that's pretty strong stuff. We've got to consider the case in a wholly different light. Crippen testified that the remains must have been there before he moved into the rented house, maybe the result of some other crime by persons unknown. The Crippens came to Hilldrop Crescent in 1905. The date would prove crucial as the trial unfolded. Tangled amidst the flesh and strands of hair, police said they'd found pieces of blood-stained cloth, including some pajamas. An officer testified that, upstairs, he had discovered Crippen's pajama trousers, but no jacket. The cloth in the cellar matched the missing jacket and even bore a label showing where the pyjamas were bought, a store called Jones Brothers. Now there was something which linked Crippen with the remains, and also conflicted with his testimony on dates. The pyjama bottom were examined by a representative of Jones Brothers together with the remains of the top, and he'd formed a view from the type of cloth used that it could only have been acquired by Jones Brothers around about the end of 1908. So how could the pyjamas have been in the cellar since before Crippen moved in, in 1905, as he claimed? Either someone else put them there, or Crippen was lying. They say that, that this convicted him. How, what do you think? How, how bad th was this evidence? It was serious, it was serious evidence against Crippen. Uh, there was, of course, the evidence of the scar, uh, mm -hmm. which was of, of great importance. So the scar proved the who? Absolutely. And the pajamas proved the when. That was the idea. For lawyer Andrew Rose, there's something almost too perfect about the evidence found by the police. A small piece of skin, but with a scar which was instantly recognizable. The stomach said to contain a rare poison that Crippen was known to have purchased. Some strands of hair, apparently female, and Cora Crippen's colour. And the pyjama fabric, the single item tying Crippen to the murder. It's a remarkable feature of the Crippen case that the remains should have been found in the way that they were alleged to have been deposited. It's extraordinary. If I were defending Crippen, I would make great play on the fact that the alleged murderer had disposed of large quantities of the 